In this video, we're going to look at one element that creates a lot of challenges in many Canadian organizations. It is the differentiation between culture and personality on one side, and the differentiation between culture and humanity on the other side. Where, do, where does that come into play? So whenever we interact with people, we always interact with them on three different levels. On one level, we are all the same. We are all human beings. We all need food, shelter, and affection. On another level, we are all different. If you think of food, we all need food to survive. We all have our own likes, dislikes. Some of us may have allergies or dietary restrictions. Somewhere in the middle, there is culture. So in the case of food, that would be Indian food, French food, Chinese food, Italian food, Canadian food, and so on. In Canadian organizations, making the difference between all three levels creates a lot of challenges in my experience. So let me start with the difference between personality and culture. That one creates a lot of challenges in one very specific situation, which, is, which goes like this. An organization has hired, hired somebody who comes from a culture that nobody is familiar with. This is the first Azerbaijani person that anyone in the organization has ever interacted with. So let's say this Azerbaijani new hire behaves in a way that annoys his or her coworkers. What are we going to do with this person? Well, the answer, in my experience, depends extensively on whether we attribute this annoying behavior to this Azerbaijani's personality or to their culture. Why is that? Well, personality is very hard to change. If you think of your, of your own personality, I'm pretty sure that you can remember your parents telling stories about the time when you were two year old and you behaved in a particular way that indicates you have a personality, personality trait which you still exhibit as an adult. Personality is hard to change, and, and it's very hard to change from the outside. The person has to want it really badly. So what does that mean? Well, since people in Canada know that changing someone's personality is very difficult, if we attribute this annoying behavior to this Azerbaijani's uh, personality, what the average Canadian organization will do at this point is, is go through a three-step process. Step one, we're going to try to coach that person. We are not going to put a lot of energy into it because you cannot change people's personality. If this doesn't work, the step two will usually be, well, we'll try and see if we can move them to another area of the organization. Maybe it will work better there. Step three, if it's a very large organization, we will try a third area. And if step one, two, and three still don't work, then we're going to get rid of that person because you cannot change people's personality. Culture is learned, so it can be unlearned. I will give you an example of a behavior I had to unlearn when I came to North America. It's when I greet ladies. In France, I grew up with the, in the expectation that when I greet a lady in a professional setting and I don't know that person, I'm going to kiss that lady on the cheeks. The number of kisses will depend on where you are in France. Where I came from, it was three, but it doesn't matter. Like, I would kiss people on the cheeks, women on the cheeks. When I came to California, I would say it took me less than a week to realize that kissing ladies on the cheeks is not going to work. And most importantly, it took me less than a month to stop when I met a lady I didn't know, moving forward to kiss her because I realized that that's not going to work. So you see, I unlearned a culturally driven behavior. And the point is, changing a culturally driven behavior is much more likely than changing a personality driven behavior. So I have seen in a number of organizations that uh, were my clients, people being laid off or fired f for, per for behaviors which were uh, attributed to their personality when in fact it was, it was due to their culture. And so the odds would have been 
fairly good to try and change that behavior through coaching. The other important difference that we need to make is between culture and humanity. Why is that? Well, 99% of the world's population grows up in an environment where everybody around us belongs to the same cultural group as us. If you think about, if you think about when you were a kid in elementary school and you think of the kids in your class, how many kids in your elementary school class did not belong to the same cultural group as you? Well, I would say in 99% uh, of the world's population's case, every kid around me belongs to the same cultural group as me. I'll take my own example to illustrate this point. I grew up in Paris. I grew up within 10 kilometers of the Eiffel Tower. Paris is one of the most multinational cities in the world. Okay? And if you've been there and you went to the Eiffel Tower, I'm sure you noticed it, because the lineup to the Eiffel Tower is the United Nations. But the point is, I grew up within 10 kilometers of that, and yet in, and in, yet in my school, all the kids were French. And so, there were a lot of behaviors which were, which were cultural in nature, French in nature, which I interpreted as being universal. One good example is dinner time. All my friends, all my relatives had dinner at 8 p.m. So as a child, I concluded the world has dinner at 8 p.m. That's a logical conclusion as a child, right? Well, the concept of statistical sampling bias only comes much later. Then I started to travel around Europe as a teenager. And I quickly realized that no, not everybody has dinner at 8 p.m. Typically in Germany, dinner will be much earlier, more like 5, 6 p.m. And in Spain, it's going to be more like 10, 11 p.m. So by traveling around Europe, I learned two very important lessons. One, not everybody has the same dinner time. And two, I need to adapt if I want to eat. Very strong motivation. But I still thought everybody has a dinner time until a couple of years ago. So for the past two years, I've been working with an Aboriginal trainer. His name is Winston McLean. He grew up on a reserve in northern Saskatchewan. He's Cree. And he said on his reserve, food was twos that would simmer all day long. Whenever you're hungry, you go and help yourself. And so Winston has grown up in, in with the image of the kitchen as a gas station. Whenever you need fuel, you refuel and you move on. There is extensive so socialization on his reserve, but not around food. So, and he said when he moved to, Sask to Saskatoon to do his undergraduate studies, he was so surprised to see that all white folks are hungry at the same time. And when he said that, I realized that even the concept of dinner time is cultural. There is nothing in our DNA that suggests we should all want to eat at the same time. So how do we manage that? Well, my experience, and this is what the upcoming videos are meant to help you deal with. My experience is there's a lot of behaviors that people have interpreted as being universal which are in fact cultural. So it is important to realize that, well, if everybody did it my way, that doesn't mean that it's universal. It may be cultural. It's often assumed. The other important element we need to deal with is the constant balance between personality and culture. Both need to be constantly taken into consideration. And throughout the remaining videos, you're going to hear me talk about the average French and the average Chinese and the average Indian and the average Canadian. None of us is the average. But this series of videos would be meaningless if I said everybody's different. Because if everybody's different, nobody's different. So we're going to look at situations where some people are more different than others.